So Arctos is a web-based collection management system, and it's also a search portal serving research-grade open source data for natural history, paleontology, earth sciences, art, and cultural collections. Currently, Arctos serves over 3.5 million catalog records for 31 museums and 193 collections. Um, because we are serving not only natural history collections now, but also cultural collections, we're in the process of shifting our vocabulary from using the term specimen to using the term catalog record or catalog item. So please bear with me as I go through this because I'm trying to make the shift myself. Um, Arctos is already also a community of collections professionals, and we work together to provide community support as well as improve data quality, data sharing, and data discoverability within and among Arctos collections and also with external data aggregators and repositories. So Arctos is based on a relational normalized data model with standardized controlled vocabularies and code tables. The goal of normalization and standardization is to make data more predictable within and across collections and in the process make them more searchable, discoverable, and linkable. In other words, clean data is discoverable data. In addition, in a normalized tabular database, it becomes easy to add new fields, to record new types of information as we add new collections. Um, as a new data type is uh, just an entry into a code table and it doesn't require any programming or structural changes. Linking identifiers such as catalog number and locality identifiers is also accomplished through just a an entry in a code table, which in turn links on, uh, turns all new and existing identifiers into links. Because of this interconnected and relational structure, catalog items may be searched for and located through multiple pathways. For example, we go through specimen search, which is the page you see right now, um, the specimen search page. But we also can find things through publications, um, uh, projects, taxonomy, media, documents, or as loans and projects. So we have uh, also through agents tables, we have lots of different ways to find our data and link across um, in, within the tabular structure of a single collection and also across collections as we share a number of these fields. Um, for this reason, we have referred to Arctos as an ecosystem of components, including loans, specimens, projects, citations, etc., which plug into each other and also freely communicate with third-party services. As a result, Arctos records are discoverable externally through unique web accessible URLs that can be shared between institutions to form resolvable, resolvable reciprocal links. And these links can include host parasites, uh, parents to offspring, uh, specimens to gen bank sequences, specimens or catalog records to journal articles, and specimens shared or catalog records shared between institutions, as well as to external tools to explore and visualize data in novel ways. So Arctos developed um, the uh, reciprocal linkage to GenBank over 20 years ago, and uh, also it leverages other external services. We're working on linking our agents tables to ORC IDs, for example. We also link to external taxonomic services uh, through, via global names. Collections can opt to use Worms taxonomy, um, which is continually updated live to the um, Worms or World Registry of Marine um, Species uh, website and is integrated with Geolocate and uh, Google Enterprise tools, as well as Crossref and PubMed services. And we can also create linkages to Morphosource, Barcode of Life, um, GBIF, IDIC Bio, and uh, Global uh, Bi Biotic Interactions, Globi, as well as between and among institutions. So, and what I'm hoping to do today is to share the benefits and challenges of linking data, as well as uh, some suggestions or some questions for how we can do this better in the future. So since I started this whole process as um, about five years ago, learning how to create linkages between hosts and parasites, I'd like to start the demo with an example of what we've uh, set up for that kind of a search. So um, going to our search screen here, again, I am not logged in at the moment, so this is the public uh, search screen. And at some point here in the webinar, I may end up logging in, but most of what I'm going to do is going to show you what the publicly available tools are. So first off, I'm going to go to uh, collection. And in our, uh, we have, again, a, a good number of collections in Arctos. I'm going to choose the Museum of Southwestern Biology Division of Parasitology as a collection of choice to search on here. So I go to our MSB portal. 
and I'm going to choose parasite specimens. Then I'm going to search on a particular collector. So I'm going to each of these things, by the way, you can show more options here. So if I show more options for collector, I can I can see not only I can search on collector, but dates, etc. And I'm going to go then to our um, basis of citation field and choose. I want something that was collected by Robert Rausch in MSB Para that has a voucher and that also has media associated with it, in this case, a multi-page document. So hopefully if I do this, I will get um, some results. So these, these are my search terms. I've searched on media type, multi-page document, MSB Para, Robert Rausch, and voucher. And um, in this case, uh, I'm going to pick one, uh, this one, this record right here, which happens to be a tapeworm from Alaska, collected by Robert Rausch in uh, 1955, I believe. Here, let's see that in a second. Trying not to scroll too fast for everybody. So this was collected in 1955 from Chitina. And scroll back up again. You can see it has some media associated with it. And you can see the identification. So just in terms of uh, some other external linkages, um, first off, uh, we have a identification of this tapeworm being a Rostrolepis macrocerosa, which is a cestode and platyhelmin. And it was identified by these authors in associated with that paper in 2013. The original identification was different, Hymenolophus forida. This was the original ID given by Robert Rausch in 19. So we were able to track the history of the identifications and also these are live linkages to our taxonomy tables which would give more information about the taxonomy of these um, organisms. Also again we can link out to the publications. Um, actually let me link out to the taxonomy first to show you that linkage. Um, so this is our taxonomy table, our taxonomy page which is searchable. It's showing you all of the specimens that uh, we have in Arctos that uh, refer to this particular taxon name. Um, showing um, exact matches, I could change that to fuzzy matches. It's showing um, any media associated with that particular taxon. It's showing how um, Arctos can is pulling th this particular name from several different taxonomic sources, including NCBI, Chief Effect on Taxonomy, and Open Tree of Life. Um, and then we have our local classification and taxonomy associated with this particular taxon name, this species name. And then I could, if I wanted to, clone some of these external sources that also have resources for this taxon. So going back to the specimen record, another uh, linkage that I can, another relationship that I can link to from the specimen record is to the um, publication that in this case is citing it. I click from my specimen record linkage to the publication. You can see that in this case, um, here's the publication. We actually have a copy of it uh, archived locally, but it has a DOI that I can click on and link externally to the publication so that uh, if anybody's interested in finding out exactly how the specimen was identified, they are able to link directly. There and other, um, and you can also see that in, in addition to this single site, uh, individual that's been cited, there's 181 total cited specimens. So I can click on that as well, and it will take me to the full list of all of the specimens that were examined and cited in that paper, including in this case, which is really neat, symbiotype, which is the the host symbiotype, the host voucher of the the species that are described in this paper. So get, I can and I can see in the single search both the parasites and the hosts and, and link back to them. Um, if this um, uh, particular specimen record did not have, excuse me, if did not have a, um, a DOI, I'd be able to use the tools to um, add that in with, from within Arctos. Could link and, because there's auto-suggest uh, terms in Arctos that will give me access to adding DOIs very easily. Okay, Let's go back. Where is meaning to go? Um, okay, so um, back to 1351. Other things that can be linked to from this uh, specimen record include media. So we have Robert Rausch's original um, ledgers that are scanned, and um, we have 
um, thumbnails that are available to see within the specimen records, but if I click out on those thumbnails, like I just, here's my, I go back here, there's the thumbnail, and I click on it, it takes me to the actual image of the scanned media, and we have great tools that allow us to highlight particular parts of the media and tag them directly back to live links to the specimen record. So this particular um, ledger, this is a pre preparation or collection ledger of Dr. Robert Rausch from the 1955, and um, he, he gave a single line of, pa of the page to a host and all of the examined specimens that were, so, or parasites, excuse me, that he obtained from that single host. So the host, um, we have two actual cataloged items for our host record in this case. We decided to create host observational records from all of these as we've been trying to track down host vouchers. Um, they are scattered across many institutions over many, many decades, and we don't always have the ability to link to those records. So we've created a host observation catalog that gives us the ability to link parasites and hosts in this way. As we find new, uh, the actual vouchers in other collections, then we can create the linkages between the parasite, I mean, excuse me, the host observation catalog and the host actual voucher catalog. And both of these in this case are tagged to the original media. And here in this one, we also have a parasite, this Hymenola vitorida, or the tapeworm that was uh, found in this host record. So it's really neat to be able to do this tagging. Not only can we link directly from the specimen records to media, but we can tag where in the media a particular, um, a particular reference was made to the specimen. If we are looking at field notes with long text descriptions, we can highlight a particular section of text that refers to this individual specimen. Or to the, uh, we can also associate media with localities, for example. Other types of media that can be linked to the specimen include images. So in this case, I've got a, uh, an image as the thumbnail, and here's the upside down image of the actual specimen slides and their barcodes. Um, and then we go down to more, in more information on the locality of this individual. Um, I can see that it not only has a verbatim locality, which was what was written either on the original data, um, and a specific locality with a clean locality that uh, we never change the verbatim locality, but we might clean up the specific locality so that it could be more readily shared among uh, specimens and across collections. We integrate uh, Berkeley mapper tools. So here's mapping tools that, again, an external resource that we can utilize to uh, link directly from the specimen data outward to be able to visualize um, our specimen data more readily. And uh, in it, we also have links to agents and agent tables. So our, all of our agents are controlled vocabulary. They must exist in Arctos before we can link to them. In this case, we have Robert Rausch. Um, the reason for the controlled vocabulary on agents, as you can imagine, is that um, uh, it's very easy to spell people's names in very different ways, including the spellings, and we find that we can re more readily share information, for example, across collections, institutions, and external aggregators on who was Roger, Robert Rausch, how did he, and how did he, where did his specimens end up, what did he do through having this uh, controlled agent table. And if I click on uh, Robert Rausch as an agent, I can also, um, here in a second, see um, all of his, the spelling variants, the versions of his name. I can see some remarks on who he was. I can see his relationships between agents. We're able to create those kinds of relationships as well. Eric Hobart was a student. He's not the same as Robert A. Rausch, et cetera. We can create these um, sort of linkages. We, uh, in this case, an external source that we are leveraging is to go to the Wikipedia uh, page for Robert L. Rausch, so I can go and there I can find a little bit more out about him. And we're also uh, in the in the process of adding in ORC IDs, as I mentioned earlier, which will allow Arctos to leverage um, that particular source as well. And then we can track everything that is related to him. He's, as any collector, there are 42,000, um, uh, he's got any collection, 42,000 things in Arctos, and this is across, as you can see, multiple collections, Art Manter Lab, Museum of Southwestern Biology, Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, et cetera. 
So that one of the biggest challenges in integrating this collection was the fact that we had to be able to work across multiple collections to track collect, uh, the parasites and hosts of this incredibly prolific collector and scientist. Um, he also has published um, over 200 publications, and we have all of those linked in here, as well as linkages to his specimens. Okay, so that's a really powerful tool that I find really useful to use. Okay, other types of relationships. And again, back to the nitty gritty of you know, what kinds of relationships do we want to be able to create in any kind of a, 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 a database to link across museums and collections. In this case, parasites and hosts. So we have a relationships field. If I expand this, you can see that, again, as I showed earlier, um, this parasite, this uh, Hymenolopus or Rostrolepis tapeworm, is a parasite of the host observational record and also of the actual host voucher. And this is a really, I think, very powerful tool because if the record is in Arctos, an Arctos collection, uh, we can pull data on the, the host or the parasite across into the specimen record that we're looking at at any given time. And this again, is this for all relations, not just relationships, not just parasites and hosts. But in this case, we're dealing with a host-parasite relationship. I can see the host record here says that this MSB host catalog record says that the host was a squirrel in the family Sayeridae. Identification, Tamiosaurus hetsonicus, or red squirrel, and it was collected in uh, Valdez Quad in Alaska near Chitina, 31.6 miles west of the highway. Well, this is good because hopefully, if I look back over here at our, let's scroll down because we have this is a big record, if I look at this is the data for the parasite. Hopefully, the host and the parasite should have the same data, 31.6 miles above Chitina. Alaska collected in 55. So in this case, yes, we're able to create these linkages so that we can pull data across. And it's quite possible that Robert Rausch, when he originally uh, collected it, I didn't actually look actually uh, back here at the media, he might have said instead of Tamiosaurus hedsonicus, he might have said red squirrel, or he might have used an older name for this particular host taxon. But what we're pulling through here is the current updated taxonomy from the host record. In, the, as in particular, in the actual voucher record, the, let's go to the mammal record here. Here's the host record in the Museum of Southwestern Biology Division of Mammals. And you can see this is the current taxonomy. And, uh, and now we're pulling, instead of looking at the host record pulled into the uh, host data pulled into the parasite record, we're looking at the parasite data pulled across into the host record. So it's a reciprocal linkage, and we're able to pull data on hosts and parasites reciprocally across. Um, so this, I, this was, to me, one of the most important things that we wanted to set up in any uh, parasite database was the ability to link across to the hosts. And again, this applies not only to hosts and parasites, but it applies to any relationship between the different types of organisms. Um, another interesting thing here with this uh, particular tool is I can say, say I want to know, I want to know what are all the hosts and parasites that are associated with each other here, rather than looking at one record at a time, can I find all of them? And we have this nice little link here, it says find all, and that takes me to a list of the host observation, the host voucher, and the parasite. So I could then go to all of these specimens and see um, their data and make sure everything is, I can access all the resources from one click. Okay, so having done that, um, this kind of relationship, the ability to pull host to parasite data or related item data across between records within, um, within um, Arctos allows for the ability to, um, going here to my next spot, um, to do searches. And those kinds of searches, let's see if I can find that here. I want to go to the, the next, an, another example, um, and that is, excuse me, um, okay. 
when I go up to my search page. So, if I go back to the search page, I want to be able to do a search on both host and parasite data at the same time. So, um, one of the things we said in the abstract for this um, talk today was that we can search on, say, all, all parasites in the family Teenidae that are parasites on canid hosts. Well, let me just give an example of how that might work here. I'm going to do a search on, again, going back to our parasite collection, in the Museum of Southwestern Biology. Scroll down. I want to find all parasites of, um, in this case, squirrels. And actually, no. I'm going to go to I'm going to go to all parasites that are. I'm going to search on them. I'm searching on parasites, so I want to search on parasites in the order Siphonoptera that are back here to relationships um, parasites of family Sciuridae and Sciuridae are squirrels. So if I do this search. Because we have the interconnectivity between the, the not only the parasite and host current identifications, we can also search on higher taxonomy. That's one of the reasons that I wanted to create a host observation catalog to embed the host name within a host classification, which would allow for searches across higher taxonomic levels. So here we have, here's our search term. Um, Museum of Southwestern Biology, Division of Parasitology, all the siphonaptera, which are fleas, that are parasites of the family Sciuridae, which are squirrels. So here I have a list of about 66 specimens here that are all listed as being fleas of squirrels. Um, this is our search results page, which I showed you earlier. One of some of the other tools that we have here, which are link outs or relationships, include being able to, I showed you a link to Berkeley Mapper earlier. Well, in this case, I have a whole suite of specimens I've searched on, and now I can show, hey, these are all the squirrel parasites, um, the fleas of squirrels that we have in the database right now in, in MSB Para, I can see in Berkeley Mapper, and Berkeley Mapper also allows you to click on the individual little circle here, so I can go directly to um, one of these records here. Let's go to this record. So this is a um, particular flea from uh, the Savietta Long-Term Ecological Research Project, which is a large parasite collection that we archive here at the Museum of Southwestern Biology. And I can see that specimen from going back to the Berkeley Mapper and again back to our search results. So you can see that, um, again, if I look at my specimen record here, um, this is a flea, Echidnophagia gallinacea. Its host is Xerospermophilus spilosoma. This is a new term, an updated taxonomic term, because the original verbatim host ID for this host was Spermophilus phylosoma. But you can see here that it's changed. It's, uh, the taxonomy for the host has been updated, and we're pulling the updated host taxonomic information in here, even though the original verbatim ID is uh, based on an older taxon name. So I think this is really important to make these kinds of linkages so that these um, Specimens of these catalog records are discoverable despite changes and updates in taxonomy or including those changes and updates in taxonomy. Some other things I'd like to show that are related to our relationships uh, tools are um, the um, GBIF, IDIG bio, and Globi occurrences here. So um, this specimen will link directly out to GBIF. So we publish uh, through the BERTnet IPT to GBIF. So I can go directly from Arctos to the GBIF record. And GBIF also has a reciprocal link going back to the Arctos record. In addition, the same thing is true for Arctic Bio. There's our Arctic Bio record. And also to our most recent edition is Global Biotic Interactions, which we're very excited about. We have a link to Globi. And as a parasitologist, uh, this is really cool because we can, um, this is a sort of centralized clearinghouse for parasite interactions. And um, they pull from lots of different sources, including museum specimen records. Um, they show some Arctos records here on this one, and I'll show some later that, and it shows the relationship between the flea in this case and the host. 
and it also shows a reverse relationship between the host and the flea. So um, we are hoping to continue to um, expand our interaction with Globy and make this uh, more powerful, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Okay, um, another e example that I'd like to pull up, it gets a little bit difficult when you're starting to look at um, cross-institutional searches. So I just showed you, I'm showing you within Arctos, I just showed you an example of within the Museum of Southwestern Biology, we have a division of parasites and a division of animals. So you can, and we can link between those two divisions in our single institution. Here's an example where we're linking across institutions. This is a University of Alaska mammal. Um, it's a vole, a little small rodent, Microtus myurus, and it, um, has a relationship of a host of a Museum of Southwestern Biology parasite. So here we have a tapeworm that is parasitizing a, a tapeworm at, in New Mexico that's a parasite that is archived as a parasite of a host in Alaska. But we're still able to create those cross uh, institutional, in this case, linkages and still pull data across institutions. And same thing even within collections. So this is, here's the host. It's also a parent. So in addition to, in addition to this vole, in addition to being a host of a parasite, and also in this case, host of an ectoparasite, an arthropod in, in a different um, collection in Alaska, it's also the parent of an, an embryo, which would be the offspring here. So if I click on this link, it's going to, I'm going to look at a host parasite. I mean, excuse me, an apparent offspring relationship rather than a host parasite relationship. So it just shows some of the different kinds of relationships. So I like this example because it really does give us the ability to link. One of the nice things too is um, I'm not logged in right now, but um, from the point of view of Alaska, we share a lot of specimen vouchers and tissues and our parts may be, there may be a skin and skeletal material in Alaska that we have the tissues for in New Mexico, and uh, we're able to um, to share that as well across these platforms and um, link to link a tissue in one institution to a voucher in another. Okay, then another example is a little bit more difficult. So here is a Museum of Southwestern Biology mammal that is a bat in this case, and these are what we have at the Museum of Southwestern Biology are just tissues. So um, we don't have the voucher. The voucher is at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, so what we're able to do is to create a relationship pointing at the American Museum of Natural History and their catalog number saying, OK, this is the um, AM and H uh, record. But I can't, I don't have a live linkage here. I can't go directly to them. Um, back at my Alaska example, if I'm not logged in, even though I'm going to cross institutions, I can, I can, let me go back to where I was just a minute ago, back here to this guy. Um, so again, I'm looking at an Alaska record, I'm logged in as a public user on, online, and I'm able to link from the host record to the parasite record across institutions and get that information and again pull that information across as to what these were. In the case of my um, American Museum example, I can create the relationship but I can't pull any information and I can't, I do not have a live link here because I can't link directly to their portal. However, I can bypass that by going to their GBIF occurrence. So in this case, um, well, I have um, I have tissues, and I want to know okay, what is the um, the GBIF record? I'm looking at my MSB record. What we're working at is here, down here, associated occurrences from the GBIF record. Then I can see that this is also the same individual as American Museum of Natural History. So we're working on trying to create a pathway to get between uh, specimen records or collateral record across major institutional platforms like uh, database platforms and uh, institutional platforms through uh, either, again, direct URL linkages or through uh, GBIF. 
So that's uh, one of our challenges to try to create those. So again, we would like to make sure that the, the tissues that we archive here can be linked to the specimen voucher in another institution. And then um, finally, uh, so my, to my last example here, here we go. Um, here's the search results from a search on um, the fleas. And I have my Kidnophagia gallinacea here example that I showed earlier. One other thing that is really neat that we're just starting to do and trying to figure out exactly the best way to do it is that um, so Arctos collections are going to be part of a NSF funded um, TCN to digitize um, ectoparasites of um, terrestrial vertebrates and we are working with Symbiota and the scan portal, the scan network to um, start publishing uh, Arctos records through their portal. Uh, to, they have a new portal that's going to be called the, um, the Parasite Tracker. And um, this is, again, a multi-institutional effort, uh, different collections from many different types of data sources and databases are going to be publishing through this portal. And um, what it's going to be um, linked through SCAM. And I just this morning created a linkage from our Arctos record, in this case, to the equivalent SCAN record. This one, this particular record is a MSB Para 8053. This is a flea that was collected at the Sevilleta. Um, this was before our parasite portal existed. It was, um, the actual voucher is um, cataloged in our Arthropod collection here at MSB. And our Arthropod collection um, publishes and serves their data to the scan, um, uh, scan network through, through Symbiota. So, I wanted to find a way, how can we link these records across between Arctos and Symbiota and then ultimately to the Parasite Tracker Network. So um, if I go, I can now link from Arctos out to the scan record if I click in here. And this is the corresponding scan record in um, Symbiota that gives you information. And it tells you here, for example, that this is an MSB mammal catalog number. Um, and one, one thing I'm hoping that we can develop um, further is to, right now, there is no live linkage back to our mammal host record. And this would be really nice to be able to, to figure out and create is some way for an interaction to happen between the scan network record and the symbiota, I mean, and the MSB Arctos record. Um, also, it's, this is going to be, again, as I showed earlier, through Globy. And let me go back to scan, actually. Um, scan real quick. So plug for scan. This is the Symbiota Collections of Arthropod Network. That's where I um, linked to just a minute ago. If we go to collections, search collections, you can see all the collections that are in scan. And if we scroll down to various regions, and we go to uh, the Parasite Tracker. These are all the collections that are going to be in the Parasite Tracker. And again, really important that we all figure out a way to integrate and share not only Parasite information, but host information across this network. And that's something that um, Globy is going to be um, heavily involved with as part of creating the Parasite Tracker network. But this is just starting. So I'm very excited about that, about the ability to, to do that kind of integration. Um, a couple other things. Uh, I don't have time to go through every single thing that we can, our relationships in Arctos, but some other ones um, would be, for example, um, Morphosource. Um, if I go back to our, or GenBank, that was another one I wanted to show a linkage to. Um, if I go to other identifier and we go look at GenBank, and I probably need to limit this. Um, let's just do um, let's do uh, Denver. Let's click on their GenBank specimens. So I, I searched at the uh, Denver collections, the Denver parasite collections, and asked for anything that has a GenBank link. So here's one here. Let's go to GenBank. Um, 
this is a Denver repair site record. It's a voucher of a couple of different uh, taxa, and it has a GenBank identifier. So here's an example of linking out the GenBank. If I click the GenBank link within Arctos, it takes me directly to the GenBank record. And in this case, um, the authors did it correctly when they submitted their GenBank sequence. They added a, um, a correct format of the specimen voucher field so that it should be possible to link backwards. Yay, it worked. Um, from the GenBank record to the um, Arctos specimen record. But even if that's not possible, because, for example, the, the authors did not submit the voucher information or they didn't submit it in the correct format, which happens a lot, um, within Arctos, we can add the GenBank accession number as an identifier. And that will automatically create a link out from GenBank back to the specimen record. So here is the same gen, uh, link, link out, which I can click from within GenBank and go back to the specimen record. And the great thing about that is that, again, I don't have to depend on the authors of the GenBank submission to do this correctly. I, as a collection manager, can, within Arctos, add that identifier. And I can log in really quick and I can show you. Oops, excuse me, wrong page. I'm in the wrong collection. I can't. Denver doesn't want me to see that. <laughs> Denver doesn't want me to look at their specimens and edit them. But if I were in a Museum of Southwestern Biology um, example, I could show you that you, how you can just add the accession number as an identifier, and it will automatically create that reciprocal link out to GenBank. Um, we're excited because also now that IsoBank is in progress, we are going to have the same functionality for IsoBank as with GenBank with being able to create these reciprocal identifiers. Some other types of um, linkouts that we have uh, between relationship between catalog items and external repositories. Here's a morphal source, which is a repository for CT scans and um, imaging. And I uh, went to, to morphal source and searched on some uh, Arctos specimen records. This one is um, at the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. They've got an image of a tooth here. And uh, they link back to Arctos. And oops, and again, I'm logged in as I have to log out as me, so I'm not. There we go. Let's go back there again. Um, I'm not allowed to go in and edit Ber Berkeley records, <laughs> but I can look at them from the outside. Okay, so here I linked back from the Morpho source record back to the original specimen record and information. Um, and um, it's being used by a project here. Okay. Uh, let me, there's one other one here that I wanted to look at. Um, barcode of life. Let's see if I can pull that up as an example. So if I go into Arctos and I want to find a record that has a linkage to um, a barcode of life identifier, bold, um, search on those. So it looks like they're at about 6,200. Um, and the first of these that pull up are Denver again. Um, let's look at this Denver record. OK. And there's the bold, and that looks actually a neon um, bold ID. What happens if I click that? Hopefully it goes somewhere. Yay. OK, cool. So that went to the bold system. And again, this is really nice because this is Something else I wanted to show, which is our developing interaction between um, uh, NEON and Arctos collections. We are, our, the number of Arctos collections are the repository for um, NEON specimens, and, which have also barcode of life identifiers. Um, okay, so those are some of my main, um, main demos for today. And um, let's see if anything else. Thanks, Marielle. Um, if anyone has questions, I've enabled your microphone. So um, if you'd like to speak out loud, go ahead. You can also um, enter your comments in the chat. 
Um, but if you do like to talk, uh, if you do want to talk, speak out loud, uh, just make sure you navigate up to the top bar on your screen and make sure that microphone icon is turned green and that way we can hear you. And thank you, Mariel. That was excellent. Hey, Mario, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, this is Carla. I have a question. Is there a way to search for um, all MSB parasites that have a host in another institution like MVZ? I know, you know, you've made the linkages, but we may not have made the linkages back. We've done it on a couple. And Mariel, I don't think your microphone is on, so you might have to reconnect. Oh, is that better? There we go. Yep. Can you guys still hear my see my screen? Yes. All right. Well, let's see that. We want to find all MSB para uh, specimens. Oops, with Ember, sorry. Wrong parasite collection. Um, oh, I might do it. Um, there we go. Parasite MSB and all right, that has um, another identifier. I'm going to try it this way. Another identifier of MBZ. MBZ BERT. Uh -huh. We got a lot of identifiers. Like try MBZ BERT. Yeah, I'm going down. There it is. All right, let's just see uh, if that results in anything. Oh, no. Probably because am I, I'm not logged in, am I? Yeah, I tried that too, and I know there's at least two. <laughs> okay, okay. Let's look at okay. No identifier of luminous B para. Um, let's do three relationships. That is a parasite of related identifier. Let's try this. Mm -hmm. Oops, I'm in U. Sorry, back up to M. MBZ BERT. Okay. Yeah. Ah. Use the relationships tool. And then, um, so that's the nice thing about the way that relationships is working across collections and institutions is it's just pulling that information uh, across the virtual private database restriction. So, and then you can um, download, I mean, if I log in, you would be able to download all these access. And another thing, for anybody who's, who's looking at these things, um, first off, it's good to just create a create a profile to be able to download information and accept the terms. But you don't have to just download the um, default information. And Carlo, this will be relevant for you. Um, you can add additional fields to your download. In uh, this case, you're going to want to add other catalog numbers. You're going to want to add related items and related specimen IDs. So um, you can also add, in case of parasites, since that's what we keep talking about, um, you can add information on whether it was examined or detected, or whether um, endo were examined or detected. We can people can search on trait data. If you want to add like weights or anything like that to do um, trait data as well. As uh, so, if I save this and refresh. Um, now I have, this is the relevant piece of information you're going to want, Carla. I've got the related specimen ID here. That's the host information. And um, right, but the other identifiers. So I, I need to, though, manually go in and add those relationships back, right? Yeah, I think we can bulk load relationships. Um, I have to go back and look at our, our bulk loader tools. Uh, right, but if you create a relationship, it doesn't magically reciprocate. You've got to actually it doesn't that. magically reciprocate. What happens is actually you should receive an email saying you have all these related items and then from that email you can go in and choose to accept the reciprocal. We didn't want to, I didn't, uh, to automatically create relationships across institutions when we figured that might make some collection managers upset if <laughs> other collections we're doing things to their data without their permission. So um, that's why it doesn't automatically. Uh, in the case of GenBank, we have a relationship. We auto-create the reciprocal. In the case of related items across 
collections and institutions, the collection manager gets an email and, and um, can go in and choose to do that. And again, you, I think you can go into um, oh, the bulk load tools that will allow you to do this as well. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Now we've, we've got a question, or we have a comment in the chat um, from New Mexico Museum of Natural History. Mm -hmm. uh, it says, I corrected the other identifier on MSB 210447, so now it links to that AMNH GBIF record. Okay. Um, so if you want to show that, uh, just, to, just to point out how that's different um, uh, okay. from what you had showed before. Here. It's 210447. Mm -hmm. Go back there. Almost. <laughs> Give me two. There it is. <laughs> okay. Yep. Um, all right. So if I go here, do I need to refresh? I'll need to refresh. Probably, yeah. And same individual as here. Um, yes. Excellent. Woohoo! Look at that. So I don't. Um, so in, in this case, um, I can get there from the GBIF occurrence, or I can also get there directly from this AMNH record by clicking on it. It takes me to this is the same individual as this record. And go to that. Um, oh, great. So Teresa is good to point out that originally, <coughs> excuse me, if I go to this GBIF occurrence, it's taking me to our Arctos MSB mammal occurrence for the tissues only. And this should somewhere say this preserved specimen, da 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 da. Um, parts should be whatever it is, tissues, I don't know, somewhere in there. But the important thing about um, what Teresa just added here, by creating this linkage, and I go, I'm going to the GBIF record for AM and H. So this is their actual data. So again, the, the cross institutional linkage. Using GBIF as the bridge is um, when all else fails, we should be able to create something like this where we can link um, derivatives. Because honestly, catalog records, and in the case of natural history collections, specimens are distributed all over the place. This was just really obvious to me when working with the Rausch collection, how many different um, places that Robert Rausch's specimens ended up. So if I go back here and I look at <laughs> look at all the different institutions, College of the Atlantic, Howard, Planter Lab of Parasitology, uh, Kenai Peninsula, Museum of Southwestern Biology, University of Alaska, NBC, all of these are different institutions where his specimens ended up, and many of them are parasites associated with hosts. And the same thing can happen with tissues in one place and vouchers in another, or parents and offspring, or associated individuals from different collections that were distributed, or barium sheets, for example, where multiple replicates were taken and, and shared out or traded between institutions. So we have a lot of different examples where we need to be able to integrate. And so this has been our solution for how we're trying to manage the, the level of complexity in these types of data um, to integrate across collections. And we would like to be able to figure out more ways to do this and more ways to collaborate with external sources as well as internal sources. I have a question. And I'll just, uh, oh, go, go ahead. Yeah? Uh, this is go ahead. Uh, Yorick. Yeah. This is Yorick from uh, uh, Globy. Um, hi, hi Mario. Uh, thanks for the, the presentation. I, I find it really, uh, really impressive how how you've established all the linkages between the records across institutions and collections. And I was wondering what your ideas are uh, having this experience of, of uh, uh, establishing and maintaining these collections on how to uh, do that across uh, platforms uh -huh. uh, and how to maintain the social and technical linkages needed to maintain that. So I, I know it's a very, sort of like a high-level question, but I'm, I'm sort of wondering whether you have any Well, my that. first thought is, and I have been thinking about this a lot recently, is that first off, we all need to talk to each other. <laughs> we need to be communicating and, try, and not working in isolation and in silos and realize that we're part of a broader community and we all have tons to offer each other from our different experiences. And the ultimate goal 
is to make all of our data linked and discoverable so that it's accessible by the scientific community, it's accessible for, I mean, we're providing historical baselines that are critically needed in this time. And we need to be able to show um, how our data can be very powerful and research grade and useful to um, the community and to the planet. So talking to each other, communicating to each other, being able, reaching out and trying to figure out ways that we can collaborate, number one. As far as across platforms, I think that the same thing. We we need to, to just like brainstorm. How can we how can we make this work? Uh, what are things we can do? And um, I mean, like I say, every, a lot of different platforms are trying to develop these same tools, but largely in isolation. I mean, I think one of the great things about Globy and the Parasite Tracker is that it's trying to to integrate across platforms and integrate across and so to make these kinds of linkages discoverable and we're very excited to be part of that effort and I think that's sort of a, a good model for how we can move forward. Okay, thank you. And so you're talking about specific tools that are sort of similar tools that are developed in, uh, in isolation. Uh, could you uh, sort of name a few of those tools? Well, let's see. Um, I, I can talk about our, for example, the GenBank linking tool. I honestly um, don't know how, I mean, we can link from Arctos to GenBank, but what if AMNH had specimens on GenBank that we wanted to link to? Would that be available? I mean, I would love to be able to link to GenBank and publications resulting from the usage of specimens, both through our tissues and GenBank and also through the vouchers at AMNH. So I'm assuming that AMNH probably has tools to link to GenBank and link to publications, but we can't right now link to each other and those tools are different. So I'm trying to figure out how can we work to, to, um, to make those compatible with each other. Um, I'm trying to think, do you have any examples? that you would like to share? You've been looking at a lot of these types of data. Yeah, well, it's, uh, what you're saying um, uh, sounds very familiar. I've been developing similar tools. And um, uh, one of the things that really helps me to understand the linkages is to, to sort of see them as uh, tables that link one thing to another. and um, I'm hoping that we can figure out a way to exchange these tables that we all have, so we don't have to exchange all the all the records that's associated to them, but just the linkages, so that you can do what you were just describing. Right? And that's actually a really good point to end on quickly here. And one of the most critical things that we need, I think, in, as a community, is something the equivalent of an organism ID that transcends collections and transcends GLIDs and, and individual catalog numbers that would allow us to track parts of, of, of catalog items that are distributed across multiple collections. So maybe we need a big registry. Maybe we need something that would be that kind of uh, one number to rule them all kind of platform that would allow us to track. Because right now we can do that through relationships, but it would be really neat to have uh, some kind of a linking number or label, as you mentioned that would allow us to associate all these parts and pieces together. So are, are you suggesting to establish a uh, linking, a, like a registry yes. of links? Yes, absolutely. That would be great. OK. okay let's do it. <laughs> OK, if anybody else has questions for me, please email me. I'm happy to um, continue this conversation, uh, answer any additional questions personally. Just let me know. One number to rule them all. I like it. Um, <laughs> thank you.